Hi, I'm Dr. Chris Hurd, and we're here at the University of Alberta Meteorite Collection in the Curation Facility. I'm going to give you a bit of a behind-the-scenes tour of the collection today, what it, what it contains and what it's all about. Before we go into this what clean room here behind me, we have to get dressed up the way I'm dressed now because there's a lot of particles that come off our clothing and our skin that we need to sort of keep on us so it doesn't get into the environment. We'll go into this clean room where the meteorite collection is kept. The clean room filters the air with Kelvin filters to take a lot of the particles out that would potentially cause contamination uh, or particles to kind of you know be stuck onto or associated with some of the meteorites that we might want to analyze later. So when we gown up, we of course put the, the gown on over top of all of our, our regular clothing. Make sure it's all snapped up. And then we take the booties and we put those on over our shoes. And those prevent the dust and dirt from the bottom of our shoes from getting into the environment. And then of course we also make sure that we have a pair of, of gloves and these, this latex or nitrile in this case, which keeps uh, the finger grease that we have on our hands from getting onto the samples or into the facility. Here we are inside the vault for the meteorite collection. Inside these cabinets here is the majority of the meteorite collection at the U of A, which consists of almost 2,000 specimens from about 300 different meteorites from all around the world. I'll give you a bit of a tour of what we have in here. One of the most famous meteorites in our collection is Bruderheim. It fell on March 4th, 1960. It's in a small town northeast of Edmonton here. And um, there was a bright fireball seen at about 1 in the morning. The very next morning, this meteorite right here was found in the barnyard of a farmer and recognized as being a meteorite. Uh, a, mount was, a search was, was subsequently mounted and uh, in the end over 300 kilograms of this meteorite were found in the subsequent days, weeks, and months in that area. The significance of that is that for the collection is that a lot of this material, not all of it, was later traded with other collections uh, to expand the meteorite collection to what, largely to what it is today. Everything's nicely organized, barcoded, uh, and also the way that they're kept is in plastic boxes, uh, such that we can, uh, with the label on the top. They're also double bagged, the label inside an outer bag, and that way the sample itself is protected from the environment, as well as from the label, uh, and kept nice and clean. And everything's organized alphabetically so that you can easily find what you're looking for. It's organized alphabetically by, by meteorite name. In the 1960s and into the 70s in this part of the world, there were quite a few fairly well-known fireball-type meteorites or meteorite falls. That's where there is a fireball, like in the case of Bruderheim, and meteorites are found shortly after. Probably the most famous of that is 1977, Innisfree. This is a famous meteorite because not only was there the fireball observed, it was tracked on a series of cameras that existed across the prairies called the Meteorite Observation Recovery Project. And in 1977, when this fireball occurred, the fireball information from the cameras was reduced. That is, it was basically solved to figure out where meteorites might be found on the ground. And a, a search was mounted and they were found at, at Innisfree, basically a couple hours drive east of here. Uh, the additional great thing about when that happens is that you can figure out where in the solar system it comes from. And this, for the, only the third time in history, was calculated to come from the asteroid belt. And it made the, the link, or it strengthened the link between most of the meteorites that we have and asteroids in the asteroid belt between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. The vast majority of the over 60,000 meteorites that are known all around the world are thought
thought to come from asteroids in the asteroid belt. But they're a, a relatively smaller number, about 150 uh, each from the Moon and Mars. Uh, and the, the Martian ones are especially interesting to me, that's what I've done a lot of my research on. And we happen to have quite a nice specimen of a Martian meteorite here in the collection. This is known as T-Sint, and it fell in Morocco in 2013. Um, what's great about this is, is well, what tells you that, that it's, it's a nice fall that is, you know, freshly fallen meteorite, is that it's a really glassy crust on the outside. The, the crust on the outside is called the fusion crust. It happens as it, with friction with the atmosphere. And it's really nice and fresh and glassy here. This has been cut open so we can see the inside, and on the inside we have this gray appearance, and that's the rock itself. We also have these sort of black little uh, pockets or, or glassy spots, black spots in here, which are actually pockets of glass that formed as the rock was blasted off the surface of Mars. The shock wave that occurred as the rock was blasted off the surface caused little parts, little uh, pockets, open spaces in the rock to collapse to form uh, little bits of melt that then became glass. And it's actually inside those little pockets that we have evidence of Martian atmosphere trapped inside. And that Martian atmosphere in other meteorites like this, uh, as well as this one, tell us definitively that this is actually from Mars. We can consider ourselves lucky when a fireball is observed and we can track its orbit and tell where it's from, etc., and meteorites are found. Most of the time, though, that's not how it happens. Most of the time, someone will find a rock that they find is unusual, typically in a farmer's field, um, and they'll contact an expert and, and, and find out that it turns it's actually a meteorite. Uh, that's just certainly the case for many of the samples in our collection. I'll show you a couple. This is, a, this is from Vulcan, Alberta, and this was found in April of 1962. It, it, it's an example of that, where uh, uh, a rock was, was found in a field, uh, and it had fallen quite some time before. You can kind of tell from the bit of the rust that you can see there. Um, but this is, a, this is one that isn't uh, on display anywhere, so one that's kind of interesting to, uh, to show you. And uh, I know the town of, of Vulcan is keen to uh, associate itself with with space through Star Trek, but they're also associated through this, this meteorite here. Another example where meteorites have been found uh, was, is white court. And in this particular case, it's unusual because the meteorites are found associated with an impact crater. These meteorites are slightly different from the other ones. They're iron nickel meteorites. And uh, the unusual thing about them is that instead of sort of being rounded and sculpted uh, by friction with the atmosphere, in this particular case, these are shrapnel. So essentially what has happened is that the object that came through the atmosphere hit the surface and exploded into pieces and shrapnel pieces that were spread over a large area. And they created a, a, an impact crater that was that's, that's six meters deep and about 36 meters across, and you can actually go and visit it. It's, it's about uh, 17 kilometers south southeast of the town of Whitecourt itself. Um, but all of the meteorites are buried in, in the, the soil, all up to 800 meters, almost a kilometer away from the site of impact. What's really cool about this meteorite, of course, is that it's been sitting in the ground for a while, probably at least 1,100 years, and uh, the outside is all rusty, but if you cut it open and polish it, you can really see that it's, it's metallic. It's made of iron nickel metal. Uh, and this is significant because it's, it is the youngest impact crater in all of Canada, um, and it's right here in our backyard. This meteorite collection represents countless research projects, and because of the way it's been curated and kept, it represents a legacy for future research. And I want to show you something that's really, really unusual um, that I think is, is really kind of exciting. Here we have a piece of the Bruderheim meteorite that was sealed in a custom-made vacuum tube in the spring of 1960. So the scientists at the time, um, Professor Bob Bollensby and Professor Bud Batsgaard and others, had the sense to, to recognize that preserving 
this meteorite, like other meteorites, against what happens in the Earth's atmosphere at the surface of the Earth, oxidation, hydration, all the things that sort of are, are so unusual about the Earth's surface relative to where these meteorites come from. To preserve it against it, they actually made a fresh, a brand new, uh, custom-made vacuum tube and sealed it inside. So you can see here, this is the meteorite. And if you compare this to even other samples of Bruderheim, it's extremely fresh. The fusion crust is very black, very dark, and the interior doesn't have any rust on it. It's sitting here cushioned with some, we think, is quartz wool. The really great thing about this is that it's been in this environment under vacuum since 1960. And now, thanks to the facility that we have right here, we are planning to open it up for the very first time and to be able to capture any gases that have come off that might be captured inside, but more importantly, to actually keep this sample under pristine conditions, but actually be able to subsample it and study it. Hi, so I'm Dr. Patrick Hill. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow here at the University of Alberta, working in cold curation and how we handle astronaut materials. So we're going to go check out the cold uh, curation facility in front of the lab. Uh, and to do that, not only do we put our clean clothing on, but we also have to dress for the weather, so to speak. So in addition to my clean gown and booties, I have some thermo boots that will keep my feet nice and toasty and make it easier for me to work in there. Some gloves uh, that are covered in nitro, so we're keeping it clean, but also warm. And of course, a coat, just because it is quite cool. Uh, it allows us to handle things at about minus 10 or below uh, degrees Celsius. Now that we're all dressed up and warm, we can hit on it. So this is our cold curation facility. It's a glove box that's built inside a freezer, which really allows us to handle uh, pristine astro materials at cold temperatures in an atmosphere. This is really great for us because these astro materials are coming from a very different environment than, for example, that we have on Earth. Uh, for example, uh, a lot of these meteorites can have volatile phases, like organic compounds, uh, that we don't want to lose in the samples. Uh, and so we can keep them at low temperatures to preserve them. In addition, if they've landed on the Earth and there's some microbial activity on them, uh, putting them in cold temperatures will help preserve them uh, and prevent that activity. The glove box is also a argon atmosphere uh, glove box. So there's no oxygen or water in the air where the samples are held. This means that we prevent any oxidization reactions and reduce reaction rates overall. Uh, so for example, we won't get any oxidization similar to what you get with steel or your car. So this is a one-of-a-kind facility that allows us to handle astro materials and keep them pristine and uh, protect them from the terrestrial environment. Cool, so we can head on in. So this is our freezer and glove box uh, facility. Uh, this is a one-of-a-kind facility uh, that allows us to interact with the material without contaminating it. Uh, in fact, we've had NASA scientists from Johnson Space Center come up uh, and work with us because they're looking at developing cold curation down uh, at Houston, in Houston uh, so that they can better handle astro materials and samples returned from the moon in the Artemis program. So this glove box is uh, a hard hard glove box, so it, it's an inert atmosphere. We introduce samples uh, through this antechamber, and we can monitor both the moisture and oxygen level throughout our uh, time working with the samples. It's really great because it allows us to handle the samples, work with them, process them, uh, while mitigating any interaction between the terrestrial environment and the extraterrestrial material that we're working with.